tips for achieving fraction collection perfection, or at least pretty good. So a lot of times in biochemistry, we're using methods where we're actually separating molecules. And sometimes it's just to get a look with like analytical techniques, but other times with preparative techniques, we're actually trying to isolate those different components. Now, if we do something like column chromatography, they're gonna be separating and they're gonna be coming out of the column. And if we were just to collect them all in like one single tube, well, that wouldn't be very helpful, would it? That would just like defeat the purpose of separating them in the first place. So you're separating them in the liquid, but now you have to physically separate them. And the way that we do this is by collecting fractions. So we're collecting small portions as they come out of that gradient or that um, column, all those sorts of things. So we can collect different size fractions and we can collect them in things like tubes or plates, depending on how many fractions we want to collect, how big of fractions we want to collect, and that sort of thing. And then at the end, we have to decide, okay, well, which fractions have what we want. Often this is done based on like, at least initially based on a UV trace. And then we have to pool together or collect those fractions that we want. And then we have a hopefully pure um, solution of that one molecule without the others. So here's just a little more practical tips about when you go about this. First, you need to think of your strategy. Is your strategy to obtain the most of your molecules? Are you, do you care most about quantity or yield? Or is your strategy to get the pure as, as pure as possible? In that case, you're going to want to sacrifice a little of the yield in order to make sure that you're only getting your protein or your RNA or DNA or whatever you're trying to separate. So often what happens is that in these techniques, you're going to have some overlap between those different components. If you're doing something where there's uh, often these fr automatic fraction collectors, say if you're working with an ACTA or some sort of gradient machine where it's going to take the sample through, um, in these cases, you have it go through like a UV visible, UV vis detector, and then um, into the fractions. So what this does is that molecules like proteins and nucleic acids, they absorb UV light. So for example, we can monitor proteins typically at 280 nanomolars where they, um, nanometers wavelength is where they absorb the most strongly. So we can measure the absorbance at 280. For nucleic acids, we commonly measure the absorbance at 260. And sometimes if we have a mixture or that sort of thing, we do a 260 and 280. Now, when the molecules are coming out, they go through that detector and you're going to, they're going to then, the detector is going to read and see like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff in there because you have all these molecules that are absorbing this wavelength. And so they're gonna send the information to a computer and then what you get this is this chromatograph. So basically you see the absorbance over time or over elution volume. So as the liquid's coming out and then as that liquid comes out, it's going into one of these fractions in, from the fraction collector. Now, you look at your screen and you get this chromatograph where you get these peaks, and each of those peaks is going to hopefully represent a separate thing, but it doesn't always represent a separate thing. If you have really well isolated things, what you might see is a really sharp peak, but if you have some overlap, what you might see is something like a shoulder where you have these two peaks kind of overlapping and you have this one big peak and then you have a little peak on the side. And there can also be multiple proteins hanging out in that bigger peak. So if you just go by the peaks alone, um, then what you typically do is you want to either, you're going to take for all the, all the whole peak, um, so including those like edges, or you can take just like the part that you think is going to be the purest. And to actually see which is the purest, then you can do something like run gel electrophoresis in order to get a sense, of, okay, well, assuming we're talking about protein size, proteins here, like how many protein bands are in those different samples. And so you would expect that at like the top of the peak, if it's a nice clean peak, you're going to see predominantly your protein of interest. If you go a little further to towards those edges, you might start seeing, especially if you see a little bump, um, that might indicate that there's another protein in there. And you can also see things like degradation products. If you have a peak on like the front shoulder, it could be something like a little aggregation, maybe some sort of dimerization, or potentially if it's something where where you haven't cleaved your protein. Um, if you were trying to cleave like a tag off the protein, it could be like a tag version. Um, so it all depends on what sort of separation method you're using and whether, or this is talking, if we're talking in terms of size, sorry, I should have mentioned before, um, that we could be separating based on other properties. And still in those cases, you get some sort of um, separation, maybe things that are similar in charge if you're doing some sort of um, ion exchange chromatography, something that binds more non-specifically if you're doing some sort of Thing like that, um, various different properties like polarity with HPLC, these various methods where you're separating things and you're looking at the chromatograph and trying to determine which peaks to take. Now, if you take that whole wide thing, now you're ensuring that you're getting like all of the stuff that you put in. I mean, there's going to be some loss of yield in whatever you do, but you're going to get 
all of it um, and hopefully you've purified away some other stuff but there's still going to be some lingering components if you want to get things as pure as pure as possible well now you only want to take that very sharp region of the peak um, and so this in this case too you would want to be like chucking a gel to make sure that peak that really is what you want um, and so then you would only take that region and now you're losing out that stuff on the edges but you're getting a more pure product so especially if you, if you care most about purity or if you care about if you have a ton a ton of stuff and you don't really need the total yield this can be easier because then you don't have to concentrate it down as much even if you have a nice pure peak if it's kind of like spread out and if you go all the way to the edges of the curve now you're including at those those edge portions those are going to be really dilute and so when you add those to that initial like high concentration part you're going to be diluting down the concentration and then you're probably going to have to concentrate your solution um, and this can be a big pain so you're increasing the volume that you're going to have to concentrate you're slowing things down you might have to add you use if your concentrator column like multi fill it up multiple times it can be a pain so if you have a ton of your protein already that tiny little bit on the outsides you can forget about it you don't need to worry but if it's something that really precious and you don't have very much well now you might want to be taking the time to concentrate even though you only have a little on the edges speaking of those edges sometimes especially as it's going through the if it goes through the uv detector and the, the tubing is kind of long it can get off in terms of what it looks like on the screen because so it'll show you like fraction one fraction two fraction three but then what's actually like in those fractions it might be a little off on the edges so it might say that this part of the curve is in fraction one but really it's in fraction two or vice versa and so especially if you have like a new fraction collector you replace the tubing these things uh, make sure that the fractions really are lining up and if you have a kind of like an edge case you want to like look and maybe like run a gel or that sort of thing also um, make sure that when the, if it's going out of one of those automated fraction collectors sometimes it can kind of have trouble depending on like whether it's a totally automated one or whether it's something where you actually have like individual tubes that you're trying to make sure that it actually goes into um, I've had some trouble where the fraction collector kind of like goes between the tubes or it has a hard time shifting over and so sometimes if you have one of those where you put the tubes into like an individual rock like this I like to like tape it down because those tubes are gonna like float out and move around and then it will miss the fraction collector which is not fun if you have one of the fraction collectors too you want to make sure that it's actually giving you like even amounts in all of the tubes sometimes you can get air in the system um, for like an active you can get air in your pump which is going to make it so that you have the fractions be different sizes and that's an indication that something is going on there that shouldn't be going on there so that is the basics with the automated um, fraction collectors with these collectors too you have the choice of what size fractions you want to make now, the finer you make your fractions, the better chance you have to separate different things. So it's kind of like in the most extreme case, if we we're just collecting into a single tube, well, then we just undid all the separation that we had. We could collect like one microliter fractions. Well, if your fraction collector goes that small, I don't know. But if you collect that many little fractions, now you're going to have to end up pulling a ton, a ton of fractions together. Now, you would have a great chance of being able to really separate as closely as you can between the different things in the mixture because you wouldn't have two of them like accidentally going like if the peak, if you have a peak here and a peak here and there's kind of like your fractions split in an inconvenient place. If you had smaller fractions, you'd be able to better resolve those apart from one another, at least physically in your sample collection, your fractionation. But if you have a bunch of little samples, well, now you're going to have to like combine all those samples together. Each time you combine samples together, you're going to lose a little bit of yield because you're always going to lose things on your tips and on your tubes and on your surfaces. Um, and so, and it's just like a pain to have to like collect those all together. Plus you might make mistakes when you're trying to find the fractions. So if you have a plate, what I like to do is I like to actually, um, like draw it out with a sharpie which wells before i actually try to collect them so i make sure because it can get kind of lost trying to figure out which number corresponds to which thing also be wary that some of the fraction collectors like on the two on like the racks they might go in like a serpentine and some of them might go like up and down and so make sure that you know like which direction things are in terms of the numbering so all this has been talking about automated stuff but if you don't have an automated fraction collector, you can still do things manually. Um, you just kind of have to stand there. Like if you're doing a gravity flow column, just have a tube. I typically do like make a rack of tubes, stick it in, wait till for one tube to get full, shift it over, manually do this. Um, and so the fractions are gonna be a little less exact sizes, um, but 
it is what it is. I mean, you're trying to collect things. Speaking of which, you don't have to have evenly spaced fractions. So sometimes you might want to collect bigger fractions of every the things just in, where you don't expect there to be any of your product, like something like the wash or the flow through. You don't want to take put it to the waste because you're afraid that you're going to like, that if your stuff actually is in there, even though it shouldn't be in there, if it is in there, then you just got rid of it. So you can collect that in like a bigger fraction. And then when you get to the actual stuff you interested in, you can collect smaller fractions. So this is assuming that you have an idea of where your fractions are going to be. If you don't, if you're just starting out, well, and it's not something where you have a wash step, if it's something where it's just like a size exclusion or something. So there's just going to be various stuff. Well, now you can just keep um, fractionate the whole thing. A note though, with size exclusion chromatography, you're going to have like a void fraction on the stuff that was already in the column. And so typically you don't need to collect that or you might want to collect it just in like one big thing. Just, just in case, like who knows what happens. Um, maybe there was even something from a past run because someone didn't wash the column. But anyway. Okay, so yeah, so then you collect fractions in the area of interest. Some of these automated collectors, they can do these things where they like detect when something starts coming off the column and then they collect fractions then. Um, other times you just like manually set it. Um, and then when you manually, manually do it, then you're doing it with the tubes. If you're manually, manually doing it, or if you have an automated fraction collector, but it doesn't have a UV detector, you can then individually test these various samples in a spectroscoper, trust spectrophotometer. I can never remember the right words phrasing for these, um, but actually test the UV um, absorption of these individually. Or if you're doing working with a protein or something, maybe you do a Bradford assay to see the total amount of protein present. Um, and, but what if you don't care about total protein? What if you care about like your protein of interest? You're just measuring with UV or with Bradford or any of these things, you're just measuring like the total absorption. So the total like amount of protein or nucleic acid or whatever. But if you only care about one thing, it doesn't matter how much there is in total, you care about your thing. And so what you can do is that you can actually do something like say if you're looking for a specific protein you can do a western blot to see if that protein is present and which fractions it's present in if you're say going after an enzyme or some sort of enzymatic activity um, you can measure the activity of the various fractions if you're trying to measure like rna polymer purify like rna polymerase maybe you stick in some dna and you stick in some nucleotides and you say okay well can you make some rna make an rna copy of this do a transcription assay um, and you do that for all the different fractions and see where the activity actually is. And this is what was used in a lot of, or I guess it's still used, in a lot of the classic biochemistry where people are trying to isolate the components, the molecules responsible for doing various processes, is they separate them in various ways and then test which of these fractions has that thing that they're looking for. And so based on what you're looking for, you can use different techniques in order to try to see which of the fractions have your thing of interest. But in all of these cases, you're relying on the fact that you're separating things, but then you're collecting each of those different separate things. And so this is where the fraction collection comes in. So that's where the decisions come into play as to like what size fractions you want to collect, where where do you want to start collecting, stop collecting, all of that stuff. Um, when Once the fraction collection is over, how are you going to decide to which pool to pull together? So remember, if you want to go for more yield, you're going to probably sacrifice a little purity but you can get like the whole stuff whereas if you want to go for more purity well now you're going to lose some yield but you'll have a more pure product um, and if you have a ton of stuff already then it's okay to lose a little bit of product um, and it might make your life easier because you're not going to have concentrate as much Often you might have a good sense whether which parts of the peak you actually want, but you want to confirm. Um, and so then you can run a gel and look and see if it really is what you think. Um, while you're doing that, you want to make sure you're keeping your samples nice and cold. Assuming this is like a protein purification or something where your protein should be cold. As soon as like your fractions are, sometimes the fraction collectors, if it's not in the cold, um, as soon as it's done, like put your fractions in the cold, keep them on ice. Um, that sort of thing be nice to them so that's just some practical notes about doing fractionation and hope it helps and happy fractionating and remember fractionating is just kind of like a fancy fancy way of saying we like take a portion take a portion take a portion take a portion oh the fractionation the term fractionation and it can also mean kind of like different things like different techniques like spinning cells down at different rates in order to isolate different components um, but the way i'm talking about it is 
um, when typically when you're using one of these like columns or that sort of thing, where things are just continuously flowing out and you're collecting samples, rather than the samples kind of like isolate themselves into different fractions, um, like by spinning things down, where you actually get like different phase separations and things like this. Here, everything's just coming out, and so you just got to capture it as it comes out, um, being able to isolate those things separately, um, so that everything doesn't just come back together after you separate it, which would be sad.